Hello again, this is Gary Zacharias with The Apologist Bookshelf. Let's take a second look at a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. I got so much out of that, I taught the Bible as literature at my uh, community college, and there was a lot of good information in here about it. The Bookstore Journal says a practical approach to Bible study in an easy-to-understand style. And I would agree with that. So I've already done uh, one podcast on that. I wanted to look at chapter 5, which is talking about the Old Testament narratives and then subtitled their proper use. So apparently there are some poor uses that we can uh, come up with. And the, the authors here are Fee and Stewart. They'd like us to have better ways of understanding Old Testament stories. And their point, which I think is uh, interesting, I'm not sure we're aware of that, uh, many of us think of the Bible as a bunch of sermons or a bunch of uh, to-do lists and things like that, and poetry, of course. <clears throat> but the single most common co type of literature that we're going to encounter when we read the Bible is narrative. Uh, something like 40% of the Old Testament is story. And the Old Testament itself is three-quarters of the Bible, so you can see so much is in there, uh, just packed full of stories. And he said the the authors say that if you just look at books like Genesis and Joshua, Judges and Ruth and First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Jonah, and Haggai, they're they're largely uh, material that's in narrative form. And by the way, let me just mention, since we're talking about things like narrative and uh, type of literature. What we're talking about are genres, you know, what type of literature is found in the Bible. And it, we would get so much more out of the Bible. And that's what I've always hoped my classes uh, appreciated is when you understand the form that you're reading, you can get so much more out of it. Because the Bible is not an unusual, unique piece of writing. It's actually using many of the ordinary things that people have loved for generations, centuries poetry and uh, story writing and uh, letters and things like that. So it's important, I think, that we really know how stories get put together in this case and uh, how to use them effectively ourselves when we're reading. So um, the, the chapter starts off saying uh, what they're trying to do in this chapter is to guide people toward a good understanding of how Hebrew narrative works. So, and this is my view as well, so you may read your Bibles more knowledgeably, and more knowledgeably and with greater appreciation for God's story. And I think that's crucial. Sure, we want to put in our time reading the Bible, but we would get so much more if we can use imagination like uh, storytellers w would require and just get ourselves into these stories. So I said, um, if you're a Christian... So you think, well, maybe the Old Testament is just for Jews and all. But if you're a Christian, the Old Testament is your spiritual history. The promises and calling of God to Israel are your historical promises and calling. So I think that's nice to kind of link us to the Old Testament. So they, they begin by talking about what's a narrative. Uh, they're stories. And uh, purposeful stories, by the way, not just kind of random off the top of the head. They recount historical events. Why? They're intended to give meaning and direction for people right now. And it said that's the way stories have worked forever, not just in the Bible. And so, in a way, the Bible stories are no different than others. But, and they point out, there is one huge difference because the stories they tell are not so much our story, like if you just listen to a story or read a collection of short stories, those are our stories as people. But they said the Bible is not so much our story as it is God's story. And I think that's a, a very good thing to think about perspective there. They said all stories have three basic parts, characters, plot, and plot resolution. I would add to that setting as well, but I'm just I'm going with what they're talking about here. So you have characters, you have plot, and you have plot resolution. And then they gave some of the names. You know, in traditional literature, a character can be a protagonist. That's the primary character. Not necessarily the good person. Right, just the protagonist. That means the one that you see on stage more than the other. So uh, modern writers especially have a lot of bad people <laughs> who are protagonists. Then you have the antagonist, the person that brings around the conflict in the story. And it said, uh, of course, if you read the Bible, God's the protagonist. And Satan or sometimes evil people are the antagonists. So what's going on? Well, he said, you know, the basic plot of the Bible story is that 
God creates people for his name and his image, and they're supposed to be stewards over the earth. But we know what happens next. An enemy enters and persuades the people to bear his image instead and becomes uh, God's enemies. All right, so let's get to what they call levels of narratives. So you have a top level. That's the one that they're just describing about God and Satan. That's sometimes called a meta-narrative. I don't know if you heard that before. That's the big picture. That's from 30,000 feet. In other words, the whole universal plan of God being worked through his creation. So you get the creation, you get the fall, you get sin everywhere, the need for a redemption, and Christ coming into this world. Right, So that's the top level of narratives. That's the meta-narrative. All right, Then there's a second level. And the second level is the story of God's redeeming a particular people for his name. And so you get uh, Old Covenant and New Covenant. And so they said uh, in this chapter, they're going to focus on the story of the first covenant. That'd be the Old Testament. Uh, the people of Israel, things like the calling of Abraham and the uh, patriarchs and the people being enslaved in Egypt and their delivery from bondage, right? So can you see the difference between the third level, the top level, and the second level? And then what else is left? Well, what's the first level? That's the hundreds of individual narratives that make up the other two levels. So this would be things like, when you think about Abraham, you got stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and even the smaller units to make that up. You know, Joseph with the brothers and Joseph being uh, sold into slavery and Joseph in Egypt and Joseph rising to the top and then Joseph interacting with his brothers. So you get these small stories that make up the big picture of God's redemption plan. And then the biggest picture of all, the third level is, of course, God working through his creation. So it says, uh, they say that it's important that when you are reading these stories, ask yourself how these first level narratives fit into the second and third levels of the Bible story. Uh, I, I love that. I think that's really good. Then they have a section called What Narratives Are Not? And he says uh, we have to remind ourselves how we should not understand Old Testament stories. So here are a couple of ways. One, they're not allegories. The Old Testament narratives are not allegories. They're not stories filled with hidden meanings. Uh, so, for example, they said, you know, you got the account of Moses going up and down Mount Sinai. That's not an allegory of the descent and ascent of the soul to God. Now, people have talked like that, um, especially back in the Middle Ages. They often saw Bible stories and turned them all into allegories. Not true. What about Elijah's battle with the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel? It's not an allegory of Jesus triumphing over evil spirits in the New Testament. Okay, so... Don't turn them all into allegories, is what they're saying. Number two, individual Old Testament stories are not intended to teach moral lessons. Um, I think this is probably a temptation of a lot of pastors and small groups and all to turn them all into moral lessons. They say the purpose of these individual narratives is to tell what God did in the history of Israel. It's not necessary to offer moral examples of right or wrong behavior. Um, and they point out that sometimes you hear people saying things like this. What we can learn from this story is that we're not to do such and such. But are we sure that that's what's going on there? Well, maybe not. How about some characteristics, the next section of this chapter, characteristics of Hebrew narrative. Okay, and they're going to use the story of Joseph, and uh, as narrated by Moses in Genesis 37 to 50. Okay, so, so they're just going to pick that story. So if you remember the story of Joseph... I'm not going to go into tons of details on it. I just wanted you to know where they're going with this. So it says, first you start paying attention as you're reading this story about the narrator himself. So he's the one that chooses what to say in the story. And he's described as omniscient. In other words, the narrator appears to be everywhere and knows everything about the story. But he, doesn't, he does not share everything. His role really is just to tell the story in a way that you're drawn into it. And so that you'll see things for yourself. So you still have to do some work as you're reading these stories from a narrator. And then secondly, the narrator is responsible for what's called point of view. In other words, that's the perspective uh, from which the story is told. And then, of course, at the end, he's presenting the divine point of view. Uh, it says sometimes God's point of view is disclosed directly. Sometimes it, you hear things like the Lord was with Joseph. And it's mentioned several times in here. So they're saying, as you read these narratives, keep looking for how the inspired narrator, narrator discloses the point of view from where you're supposed to uh, 
understand the story. Okay, let's go to scenes. It says the dominant mode of narration for Hebrews when they told stories was scenic. In other words, they moved the action along by a series of short scenes that made up the whole. Uh, you know, some modern authors will do that too. I think about uh, Michael Crichton in his Jurassic Park stories. He takes very short scenes to, and puts them together, uh, almost like a, a puzzle or something with small pieces and puts them together. And they said, notice how it's done in the Bible. If you go to Genesis 37, you get these scenes. Joseph squeals on his brothers. And then you're uh, informed why the brothers don't like him. Parental favoritism. Then it shifts, this is still Genesis 37, and then it shifts to two scenes where he starts recounting these dreams. And then you get the story of Joseph out searching for his brothers but not finding them. So you, you see all these little tiny scenes that make up the narrative work. Um, it says another feature of these uh, scenes is that most scenes only two or three characters are in place. You don't want to have a lot of characters, obviously, because that confuses things and makes it a little thicker and hard to get through and it would intrude on the main idea. Let's go to characters. Characters are central. They're central to the Hebrew stories. But it says, notice that characterization doesn't have much to do with physical appearance. We make a big deal about that today. And I think back to, I was just reading some Charles Dickens stories, and he depended heavily on physical description, what their character's nose look like, their ears, their hair, the eyes, the eyebrows, uh, whatever it is. But it said, you hardly ever see anything visually about these characters. Hebrew narrative is just not interested in that. More important are things like status. You know, where are you in society? Are you wise? Are you wealthy? Or maybe profession. And again, let's think about those stories of uh, Joseph here. We had captain of the guard. We have wife. We have cupbearer. We have baker. And sometimes the, the uh, characters are described by whatever tribe they're part of, the Midianites, for example. So characters are often in these stories. Be watching for this. And I've pointed this out to my students in, in my classes at school. Characters sometimes are there to contrast or clash with other characters. It says that's most often when they're contrasted. Uh, check them out. You see the clash between Joseph and his brothers, especially. And uh, we see others as well, but I'm going to keep moving here. The prominent way characterization is done is not in the narrator's own description. It's watching the character do things, watch their actions and watch their words. And it says, uh, look at Joseph's moral character developing from negative to positive. That's a main theme all the way through. At the beginning, he's kind of a spoiled brat, isn't he? But his moral character comes along as he deals with Potiphar's wife and even the way he handles his brothers and all. So keep watching the characters. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're saying. And uh, that's how you're going to learn what their heart is like. Okay, the two authors also talk about dialogue. They said that's critical. That's another crucial feature of Hebrew narrative. That's a good way of characterization. And I would do the same thing. I would say the same thing to my classes. Listen to what they say. That reveals their heart. In fact, if you just talk to a person on a day-to-day -day basis, much of what we say to each other does not reveal our heart. We say, hey, nice weather. Or we say, how about those Padres playing baseball? I mean, whatever it is. That doesn't really reveal much about us, but in a story, a lot of that stuff is stripped out. And instead, we get primary information about the person coming out from what they say. So they point out the same thing. The first point of dialogue is a clue to the plot and to the character. Okay, so it's an interesting example. Back to the Joseph story. He's narrating his dreams. Well, what's that show you? It shows you a lot of arrogance. And then listen to what the brothers say back. Will you actually rule us? I mean, you can tell they're not going to go for that. This is uh, setting up a pretty big conflict. And then sometimes uh, dialogue will function as a way of characterization of, uh, as well of the contrast between something like Joseph and Potiphar's wife, as an example. And then third, sometimes the narrator will emphasize a crucial part of the narrative by having one of the characters repeat or summarize it in a speech. So they said, look in uh, Genesis 42, 30 to 34, and look at Judah in 44, 18 to 34. They said, you got speeches of the brothers. So they said, don't go too quickly through those repetitions. They often tell you something really useful.
Okay, one more feature that they talk about here, of course, is plot. And it says usually most stories, and you know this, most stories are moving forward because of some kind of conflict. And uh, they point out that plot in a Hebrew story moves at even a faster pace than modern narration. It says even faster than short stories. So be alert for the way the characters uh, are moving along and things are happening to them. They said you'll see the dialogue or a uh, sudden elaboration of detail. And so the characters are, are hurtling along through their stories. Okay, maybe, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time here? It says features of structure. It says you got uh, structural features designed to make the narrative memorable. Uh, how do they do that? Repetition. They'll do key words. It says, for example, notice the emphasis of the word brother in chapter 37. It, it occurs 15 times. And you get the repetition of the word hated in there. So repetition is really important. Look for that. Uh, it says especially happens when the narrative is starting in again after some kind of interruption. Uh, look for, I think this is amazing. There's something called chiasm. It's a, it's a form, it's a structure in which a whole book of the Bible or a small part will be structured this way. It'll go A, B, C, B, A. In other words, something happens, that'd be A. Something else is brought in, that's B. C will be kind of a turning point, and then the whatever happened in the second part will be repeated in the fourth part, and then the last part will echo the first part. So you get this kind of an hourglass shape, moving toward the center and then moving back out again. So they said the whole book of Deuteronomy is structured that way. So uh, look for those. And um, foreshadowing, something is noticed early in the story, it's picked up later. You see that quite a bit in the Bible. And then uh, they point out at the very end of the chapter, it says in any biblical narrative, God is the ultimate character, sure. And then um, they talk about reading between the lines in the story of the book of Ruth. And I think I will skip over that. Uh, it's quite a bit of material here. And then some final cautions. Uh, they said list some of the most common errors of interpretation when you're reading a Bible story in the Old Testament. Allegorizing, once again. Uh, decontextualizing, they call another one. Ignoring the literary and the historical context. Okay, so don't take the things out of context. Uh, I can give you a good example of that. They didn't mention this one, but in um, Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and all. People grab that. Christians pro uh, grab that today and they make that a big uh, uh, motto and they put it on the walls and things like that. They have it on posters. But if you look at the context, that was God talking to the children of Israel after terrible things that happened to them. So that was for them. And so it's been decontextualized and brought in for us. Okay, um, so be careful about moralizing. Uh, said the uh, moralizing reader always says, so what's the moral of the story? You know, what can we learn about this? Is it ignores the fact that the narratives are written to show God's story as he's redeem, redeeming the people, not for principles, not for illustrations necessarily. Um, okay, so... <laughs> No Bible narrative was written specifically about you. <laughs> uh, it says you can never assume God expects you to do the exact same thing that the Bible characters did. Yeah, good point. And then I won't uh, cover this now, but if you do decide to pick this book up, you ought to take a look at page 106. They have an, a 10-point section here, Principles for Interpreting Narratives. Okay, so, um, yeah, I just don't think I have the time to do that now, but maybe I'll pick this up another one because I like this. So that's page 106. All right, well, thanks. Again, this is uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Really good book if you want to come from come to the Bible with a different perspective than just Sunday morning sitting there listening to a sermon. This is a different way. It'll be an enriching um, experience, I think, for you if you approach the Bible in this fashion, looking at it as literature, looking at it as authors writing in certain styles. Now, the Hebrews had styles are a little different maybe than what we have today, but you'll recognize poetry is poetry. And uh, these stories do many of the same things that they do today. So I hope this is helpful to you. And uh, thanks for listening. Talk to you later.